Erev Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, pardon uh, the feline there. And of course, a rainy afternoon here. Um, wanted to, to share with you some breaking news. And uh, while well, I say breaking, it came out April the 3rd on CatholicCulture.org, where they speak about the Pope drops traditional titles, including the Vicar of Christ or the Vicar of Christ. You know, years ago, or I shouldn't say even years ago, not too many years ago, just within the last couple of years, I was still looking at the Vicar of Christ or, or Vicarious Filii Dei as being the uh, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. <clears throat> and uh, and it's not been to more recently that I've really had to seriously rethink some of the things I've thought about before. And But in seeing the Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, now going to his, by his actual name, George Bergoglio, dropping the titles, it lets me know he has conceded his power over unto the beast. That's exactly right. So there are a lot of things that we are re-looking at as we look at prophecy, look at things being fulfilled. Let's look at the article right here, though. Pope, Pope drops traditional title, including the Vicar of Christ. Uh, uh, initially, he, 2020 edition of the Anurio, the page devoted to Pope Francis is headed simply by his name, George Maria Bergoglio. Bergoglio. Past editions have always been headed by the t uh, titles according to the Pope, beginning with Vicar of Jesus Christ. Other titles have been Successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff uh, of the Universal Church, Primate of Italy, uh, Archbishop of the Metropolitan Roman Province, a Sovereign of the Vatican City State, in 2020 edition, these titles appear at the bottom of the page devoted to Pope Francis, identified only as historical titles. Something is definitely going on, and it is certainly, I believe, a biblical uh, insight for us to consider. We also read, I have it highlighted in blue, in 2006, Pope Benedict XVI dropped another traditional title, Patriarch of the West, the Vatican explained that elimination of this title could prove useful to ecumenical dialogue. Well, it's no wonder, especially if we go back and look uh, uh, at the, uh, let me just find here, uh, uh, Chrisma, Chrisma News, and of course this is an old article here from I think around 2014, yeah, 2014, when Kenneth Copeland and a, and a whole group of evangelical pastors, Pentecostal pastors, were meeting with Pope Francis, basically handing over the evangelical uh, faith, the belief, the, the fundamentals of uh, the faith in Jesus Christ were being handed over to the Catholic Church. And of course, what we did not realize at the time was that the Catholic Church was ceding its own power to Israel. Now, it's no wonder with that news there coming out that we're also seeing news like we have here on uh, IVAR uh, yield.com in this article right here the news that matters Israel's health minister the Messiah will arrive in April now whether or not he arrives in April or not is neither here nor there in my book but what I am looking at is that there are a lot of comments coming out of Israel from the Orthodox community that the Messiah will arrive this year. The article says here, this is what Litzman he has said, recorded by the newspaper, The Times of Israel. And of course, they quote the scripture of Daniel 9.25, which only applies to Jesus Christ. You must know and understand from the issuance of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of the anointed leader is seven weeks and four and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt, a square moat, but in a time of distress. Daniel 9.25. Well, we already know that was fulfilled when Jesus Christ appeared on the scene and, and uh, what was it? I think uh, I think it was actually on Palm Sunday, uh, 33 or somewhere around there, A.D. So we continue on. It goes on what I have highlighted here. Not to congregate in places. Uh, excuse me. This will respond to reminding that Israeli people to wash hands to ensure social distancing and not to congregate in places with more than 10 people. The minister added that if people don't comply, it will be problematic. He also added that God is watching over us. I kind of think it's interesting that they chose 10. So if there's 10 or less according to the law there, 
you can congregate. Why? Because Israel believes that as long as there's ten praying at the wailing wall that God will spare the city according to what it says in, uh, with Abraham if there were ten righteous over Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> I hate to tell you, but that doesn't work. But when asked about the chances of Israel continue to under uh, complete shutdown until the Passover holiday, Lit, uh, Litzman offered a rather unconventional response saying, God forbid. We are praying and hoping the Mashiach, Messiah, will arrive before Passover, as it is a time of our redemption. I am sure that the Messiah will come by Passover and save us the same way God saved us during the Exodus and we were freed. The Mashiach will come and save us all. Well, I found that very interesting when I saw that, especially in light of not only this, the Pope of Rome, conceding his power as the vicar, which vicar is instead of Christ, or instead of Jesus Christ, but in this, more specifically, the vicar of Christ is to replace or, or a substitute for the Messiah. This would be why the Pope would renounce his title. He is making way for a new Messiah, and as I taught the other day from the epistle, first epistle of John, those that do not confess that, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is of an antichrist spirit. So the very fact that the Pope of Rome, would, which I never believed him to be the vicar to begin with, let me make that clear, but the fact that he's conceding his traditional title is also showing that he is subservient to Israel. So, but I do want to make that clear. I have never been supportive of the Vatican claiming to be the Vicar of Christ. There is no substitute for Jesus Christ. He is the one and only true God and He is our Savior. So, let's continue on, guys. I want to turn with you to Revelation. Something that really caught my attention here when I looked at this, especially with what the Pope is doing. Revelation chapter 17. And, uh, and, and by the way, I have the King James Version. It's, it's not that I'm partial to one translation more than the other. There's all of different ones have good, very valid points, uh, but I'm not a Greek scholar, so I, I can't say. But in verse 1, we start with, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. I mean, just, let's just start from the beginning. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, talked to me, saying, unto me, come here, or come hither, I will show you, show unto you, the, the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now I kind of highlighted some things separately intentionally. One thing that caught my attention is that the kings of earth have committed fornication. With who? This great whore that sits on many waters. Well, most kings of the earth in the Gentile world in the last 2,000 years, regardless of not getting into doctrinal issues of, you know, well, they were Catholic or whatever, but as a general rule, many of the kings of the earth were professing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So if they're committing fornication, that means they're rejecting Christ, and instead... They've committed fornication with this great whore. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Whose fornication? The kings of the earth. And if you notice, it is the leaders of the world that have put all this emphasis on the modern state of Israel. So he goes on to say, Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Remember, Leviathan also has seven heads, if I'm not mistaken, or, or multiple heads. I don't, know if, I don't forget if Leviathan has mentioned how many heads, which is the serpent, right? Just keep that in mind. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. Her fornication. All right? And many times I would look at the Pope and I'd look at the, uh, the cardinals and I would see them decked in their robes and things and think of the same. 
only to discover that even the high pri the priest of Israel also have worn these exact same colors if you go back and look at biblically speaking. So let's look at that again. So and the woman was arrayed in purple scar and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was was a name written Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, again, I used to apply it to the, to the Catholic Church, but look at what, look what we're seeing. The Pope is conceding over his own earthly title, man-made title, it's not a godly title, as the substitute of Christ, and putting himself underneath Israel. And with that in mind, and we see Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, who was the one that actually committed harlotry in Babylon? Right? Mystery Babylon the Great. Well, according to Ezra, all right, if you remember, if you you guys that, that, that have been with me for a long time, we've talked about this so many times, especially more recently as we talk about the beast kingdom. In the book of Ezra, we see that, um, and I'll pull this up for you here in just a minute so you can follow this with me on the screen, but um, we look at Ezra chapter 9, when the children of Israel, or the, uh, the house of Judah, I should say, the house of Judah was down in, uh, they were in Babylon, and we find in verse 1 chapter 9, the people of Israel and the priests and Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. Doing a what? According to their abominations. Even the Canaanites, Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, and the Egyptians and Amorites. But doing what? According to their abominations. Alright? Now, let's jump back. Revelation again. Right? Verse 4, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So, according to Ezra 9, the abominations they did was according to what that was done, the Hittites, the Perzites, and the Jebusites, which was the Nephilim race. All right? So anybody that remembers that and knows anything about that book of the book of Numbers, okay, as I've shared many times with you, I think it's Numbers chapter 13, verse 23, and I'm a little slow on the computer here, so just bear with me here as I can pull this up for you. Uh, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, or Anak, who, who come of the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. That's what Joshua said about those inhabitants of the land, which were the Canaanite, Perzite, Jebusites, etc., right? But now the remnant of those people, we find in Ezra 9, they're all the way over in Babylon because they went into captivity along with the house of Judah. And then he goes on to say, not just abominations, but now we got fornication. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. There it is. What is that? Committing fornication. Who's, who's guilty? The princes and the rulers have been first in this faithlessness. And there you have it. So, when we look at Revelation, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, it was the house of Judah that became the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And when Jesus came on the scene, what did he have to deal with? He had to deal with what? He said a bunch of vipers and serpents. Right? But let's go on. And I saw the woman, right? Verse 6. The woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Do you remember, and I believe this is in the book of Matthew, so give me one second here as we try to get to that spot again. In Matthew 23, I believe that also can be found there as well. 
Uh, and of course, we know this is where Jesus as well is talking about uh, uh, the, the Pharisees being part of the remnant of the serpent, uh, reptilian race, the Nephilim in other words, right? But he also puts all the bloodshed, right? Let me just find that for you real quick here. Uh, even so, you outwardly, here we go, verse 28, appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. What do you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers in the blood with the prophets. Blood of the prophets, excuse me. Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Now also if you remember, um, yeah, here we go, here it is, right here, this is one I was looking for. Wherefore behold, verse 34, I send unto you prophets, wise men, and scribes, some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barcaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. So he's putting both future, past, and present sins of blood and blood guilt upon the Pharisees or this reptilian race. Which, oddly enough, is exactly what we find in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So the saints, going back, the prophets, etc., the martyrs of Jesus, all the apostles thereafter, and even up until this day. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Now this is where it gets interesting. And we're going to close with this part here. Right? With which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. The only beast that was ever put in the bottomless pit was Satan himself. And we know this even by revelation, because it talks about after the thousand years ended, he'd be loosed again to deceive the nations, right? Now there's a lot of debate over that, so I'm not going to get into the, to, the, to the debate. But I want you to think just for a moment. Satan is the only beast that gets put in that pit. And in this case here, even if you look at it from Revelation 20 aspect, he was, he deceived the nations, he was not, he was put into a bottomless pit and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit because it says in Revelation 20 he will, be, he will deceive the nations once again. But watch what it says. And goes into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. What are they going to wonder about? Oh wow. I thought, I thought this was supposed to happen at the, after the millennial reign. What's going on? The devil, the beast, the Satan himself has been loosed and I thought we were supposed to be taken out of the way. And when they behold the beast that was and, and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on the which the woman sitteth. You know, we know that Rome sits on seven mountains, no doubt about it. But also Jerusalem has seven peaks as well. Think about it, guys. We're living in a very critical time. The beast kingdom is being reestablished. Right now, America is no longer the America you thought it was, that you woke up to a week ago. We no longer are being ran by one leader. But I think you should be able to see between the lines, like some of you pointed out, the presidential seal is not there. Recently also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, his advisor, Washington active uh, Thomas Mo uh, Modley resigned Thursday amid mounting criticism for his disparaging comments. Whoop, it changed on me here about the commander of the USS Theodore Roosevelt who fired over a leaked letter requesting aid for the coronavirus outbreak aboard ship. 
So maybe it might help you to really grasp what's coming, what's, what's coming, what's happening right now. Uh, and I do believe that we are going to see martial law very soon. And I think that when people begin to wake up and recognize what's going on, what's really going on, that's when you're going to see the martial law for sure. They're not going to allow the people to take a stand on where you're being uh, duped into believing things that may not be as though they are. I'm Steve Benoom. You're watching Israeli News Live. Good evening.